happy Friday and welcome to not just another episode, the last episode of Brain Scratch for the year 2020. Of course, the next two Fridays are both holidays, so we are taking some time off. Going to recharge the batteries a little bit for Brain Scratch, but don't worry, we've got other content coming your way for next week. Case Cracked and Seriously Mysterious still happening next week. The following week, we're back with another Case Cracked, another Seriously Mysterious, a new Searchlight, and on the 1st, January 1st, a new episode of Crime After Crime. So plenty of content coming your way over the next two weeks, but for Brain Scratch, last one of 2020. And what a year it has been. Uh, A lot of really tough cases a lot of heartache, uh, and hopefully a lot of good that we did as well, raising exposure to those cases, making donations to those cases. So I just want to take a moment and thank all of you for helping me do that with Brain Scratch. I really appreciate you guys. So for today, I thought we'd do things a little bit different. We're going to do kind of what I consider a old school Brain Scratch episode. We're looking into a little bit of a historical mystery, and it is Christmas themed. So I guess we could say it's a Christmas story. It sounded better in my head. Uh, I want to take a look at this with you guys, and it's actually going to start us with a different mystery, something else that I didn't expect until literally I just turned on the recorder and took a look at this website. Starting at listverse.com, we have a listing in their section of mysteries, 10 unsolved Christmas time mysteries, and it was posted December 22nd, 2014. Before we get into the actual item on the list that we're gonna be covering today, anyone recognize this name here? Robin Warder. Now, admittedly, that might be a little bit of a common name, but I know a Robin Warder. He works on a podcast called The Trail Went Cold. As a matter of fact, I'm a patron of this podcast. Uh, When I went to CrimeCon the first time, the first person I saw that I recognized going into the hall was Robin Warder. I was pretty excited to finally get to meet him, but I didn't know. And even here on his profile, it doesn't mention anything about him doing any work uh, writing like this. Now, knowing his work, I I should be uh, very aware of the fact that he's obviously a writer. I think one of the strongest things about his show is the writing. But uh, so I was curious, do you guys think this is the same Robin Warder? I went, I clicked on the link here. It just takes you to all the articles that have been written by Robin Warder, but it doesn't really tell you anything else about him. Did just a little bit of more digging and I found this article at medium.com, public servant by day, true crime podcaster by night. And it's all about Robin Warder. Uh, Talks about how during the day he works as a, I believe it's a records, yeah, a records management officer for Global Affairs Canada. But down here, why he started, Robin worked for years as a freelance writer, including Cracked and Listverse. So uh, guess what? Bingo. Uh, it's the same guy. Uh, Robin, I had no idea. And and of course, if you guys watch True Crime Game Time, you know that we actually had him on the show as well. Uh, all right. So big thank you to Robin, first of all, for this information. And we're going to start with just a couple of paragraphs here. Of course, I've got all kinds of other articles lined up. What's really tough about cases of this age, we're going back to 1885, is finding solid details from the time. 1885, I know we're not going to find any television coverage, no radio coverage, maybe some type of publications on this case. Let's keep that in mind as we roll forward. But what is this mystery about? A farmhand named John Larson spent Christmas 1885 with his employers, Patrick and Matilda Rooney, an elderly couple who lived just outside Seneca, Illinois. They shared several drinks before Larson retired for the evening and went upstairs to bed. Sometime during the night, He underwent a coughing fit and had trouble breathing, but soon drifted back to sleep. When Larson woke up on Christmas morning, traces of soot were on his pillow. Larson went downstairs and was shocked to find Patrick dead in his bedroom. Matilda was nowhere to be found. Later that day, Larson wandered into the kitchen and found a large blackened hole in the floor. It rested alongside what appeared to be the charred remains of a human foot. A pile of ash was inside the hole. That was all that was left of Matilda Rooney. Now, I don't know about you guys, but uh, when I was in school, 
I remember pretty distinctly first hearing about spontaneous human combustion and just being terrorized at the thought of it. Just the thought that you don't have to be doing anything in particular and all of a sudden you could just catch on fire and completely burn up. And it seems like that's what this case is on the outset when we look at these details. But quite honestly, now looking at it through a bit of a historical lens, having some more current information, is there a chance that this is actually an unsolved murder from the time? Is it possibly an accident that was miscategorized? We've got a lot of different things to consider as we continue going through the details here, but let's go ahead on to the next source at tampabay.com, uh, an article about people who have burst into flames. They're one of the grisly wonders of the world. Apparently normal people who suddenly and quite inexplicably burst into flames. They're the victims of spontaneous human combustion, or SHC. Over the past three centuries, there have been a dozen or so documented instances. Now, this was written in 2005. I could tell you a lot of the more current articles on this. I think they've done a little better job in terms of tracking the older cases. There's actually hundreds of cases that have been documented. Uh, I think over the past three centuries, you're probably in the two to 300 range, not just a, a dozen or so. But in this article, they talk about several, and of course, they do touch on the one we're covering today. Next morning, the remains of Mrs. Rooney were found on the bare ground, a few feet below the floor of the kitchen. SHC had consumed the 200-pound woman and the floor immediately beneath. Nothing else in the room was damaged except Mr. Rooney. He was found dead, but with body unburned on a rocking chair in the kitchen. A jury ruled he had passed out and been asphyxiated by smoke from his wife's burning body. Now, I'm sharing this part of the story with you guys because one of the things about looking into cases this old is conflicting information. And here, we've got a couple points where we're gonna find other sources that don't quite match, particularly the 200 pound woman. Um, I'm seeing other information saying it was 160 pounds actually. More importantly, uh, the location of the husband's body. Here it's saying that he was in a rocking chair in the kitchen, essentially the same room that she burned up in. Um, other reports are saying he was actually, I believe, in their bedroom. Now, I can't get a clear distinction if their bedroom is upstairs or downstairs. I know there is an upstairs because that's where their guest, John Larson, was sleeping, supposedly in a bedroom upstairs with the door closed, uh, which explains why he didn't suffer the same level of smoke is, uh, inhalation and asphyxiation that uh, killed her husband. So let's continue. I found a good article. I'm not familiar with this web source too much. It's called read.cash, but I can tell you um, I'm using a couple pieces of this article. There's a lot more to this article that I have verified from other sources and they are accurate. So I'm feeling pretty decent. And of course, we're kind of looking into a legend here. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, I mean, I'm still going to have a critical mindset, but, um, you know, beating up the sources too hard is, I don't think it's going to get us very far because quite honestly, not a lot of sources to even bring into the conversation here. Larson alerted neighbors that something was wrong in the house. He himself had been nearly asphyxiated by the smoke inside. So the horror within was not fully explored until a doctor from Port Huron, Michigan, Dr. Floyd Clenenden, arrived and performed an inquest. In all, Mrs. Rooney's formerly 160 pound body had been reduced to just 12 pounds worth of remains. Nothing else in the kitchen was damaged by fire directly. The estimated temperature of the fire that consumed her was 1400 degrees Celsius or 2500 degrees Fahrenheit, but there were no other signs of fire damage other than that spot. Um, now, I, I don't think that estimate is actually coming from the doctor's inquest information, I believe that is kind of anecdotal information that's coming just from knowing, um, like doing a quick web search on what it takes to actually cremate a body, because I'm, I'm pretty familiar with this range of, of temperature myself because of that. Um, it, it's just, I think it's a little bit of a question because we're going to get into some of the technical 
end of what happens in some of these cases, and I don't know that the fire is actually getting that hot. It was further stated that her husband has had been asphyxiated by the fumes rising from his wife's burning body while sleeping off the drinks. Now, they had both been drinking uh, whiskey, I believe. Patrick had died of smoke inhalation. This explained Larson's coughing fit during the night. He was spared from death because he slept behind a closed door on the second floor. Even though there was speculation that Larson had, could have, murdered Matilda, it seemed impossible for him to have started such a blazing fire without damaging the rest of the house. John Larson was cleared of the suspicion of murder because rising soot from the fire had left an outline of his head on his pillow, proving he had slept through the strange event. I don't know about you guys, but information like that, it sounds, you know, that's the hard thing about looking at legends like that. There's there's certainly embellishments that are happening in the information as the years go by. That one in particular, I don't know if that's actually true because I'm finding some information that actually John Larson did not live very long past this. I don't know. Um, I mean, you know, I guess he was cleared of suspicion maybe by officers that were there at the scene immediately like that day or over the next few days. Um, but I don't know. That just that sounds sounds a little kind of legend hokey to me. It's possible that excessive alcohol consumption caused Matilda Rooney to spontaneously combust. A prominent local legend was that she suffered divine retribution for daring to drink so much on Christmas Eve. Just considering for a moment the possibility of this being a homicide, um, I don't know. I, I suppose that if there was a different mechanism that was used for actually killing her, if it wasn't the fire that killed her, um, that perhaps the person that did it would be concerned about her body being found and that being discovered. And maybe they would essentially start the fire in some way, put some type of accelerant on her clothing. Um, but positioning her in a kitchen for doing something like that, Maybe that's where it happened. Maybe there was other items that were part of the crime that they wanted to include in the burning process. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of strange. And of course, you get this information about, well, nothing else really burned. Yeah, but kind of, because we're hearing that the remains were actually found in a hole. So part of the floor certainly burned because it, it burned through the floor. Um, but the fire just didn't really spread out from there. And I, that certainly raises some suspicions as well. Now, uh, I wanted to look for information for source information on this. And I tried trustyoldnewspapers.com, which does have publications going back uh, all the way to 1882, I think. I think I went as early on this. No, actually, it's even earlier. If I recall correctly, they go back into the 1700s. I pushed it up to 1882 because I was trying to get the date range close for finding her name. In, in Illinois in particular, uh, we get one hit from 1882 all the way to current, and that is something that's obviously not about this case. No other hits for Matilda Rooney, so obviously newspapers.com not going to be very helpful, but I did bump into some information, and very quickly, I want to thank anomalyinfo.com, which is a website I've kind of hit uh, in terms of looking in these kind of fringy cases a few times. I really like the information presented there, but what I like most about the information, he cites his sources. Thank you to AnomalyInfo.com. I learned about the Therapeutic Gazette, a monthly journal of general, special, and physiological therapeutics, published 1887 here, um, and a very particular article in a particular volume, volume 13, which of course I'll have a link to this down below, but you know what? I think we're going to read this whole thing. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure no one from the Gazette's going to be too upset, and I'm giving them credit. Um, a Case of Spontaneous Combustion in Man by Floyd Clenenden. That name sound familiar? Yeah, the, the doctor that we were talking about that actually came to um, do the analysis and perform the inquest, an article that's written by him. Dr. G.A. Stockwell of Port Huron, Michigan, Writing in the Therapeutic Gazette for March on, quote, spontaneous combustion of the human body, called to mind a peculiar case which came under my observation while coroner of LaSalle County, Illinois. I will give the facts and then leave it to the judgment of those who may be seeking evidence pro and con on this subject, upon which we have all read 
but no, no more. On Christmas morning, 1885, I was telephoned to go to Seneca, a village in the eastern part of the county, to hold an inquest on the bodies of Mr. and Mrs. R., who were found dead in their farmhouse near said village. I immediately got on a train and in due time was at the scene of disaster where I found a large crowd of curious spectators. I at once impaneled a jury of the most intelligent citizens, one of whom was an MD, and proceeded to investigate. The first thing that attracted our particular attention was the peculiar sickening odor which pervaded everything in and about the large frame farmhouse where the accident occurred. The inner walls of the house and the furniture were heavily coated with a dirty, greasy, sooty substance. We found the house was occupied the night preceding by Mr. R. and wife, an aged couple of Irish people who were both, more especially the lady, addicted to the excessive use of whiskey, and an old Swedish man who was almost an imbecile and perfectly harmless. Very interesting assessment being made by the doctor there. And kind of strange to me that um, there's such emphasis on the word perfectly. I don't know if you guys can see it because I know the text is kind of small, but uh, it is in italics. And there's not a whole lot of that happening in this article. Um, we've got one other use around particular attention. Uh, just a few uses. I, I don't know why they're pointing that out, but it just seems to me that the doctor is trying to say that um, he's almost certain that this man had nothing to do with it. The latter invariably got up at five o'clock, but on this occasion, he did not arise until near eight o'clock and was scarcely able to give the alarm to neighbors near by owing this to his being nearly asphyxiated in his room, which was in the upper portion of the house and the doors closed between. He died two weeks later from the effects of the poison inhaled that night, as supposed. Uh, kind of interesting and a little bit of a different telling here. So according to the doctor, he basically woke up choking and almost couldn't speak, like got to the neighbor's house to try to tell him what was going on and barely could. On entering the house, we found Mr. R lying dead on the floor by his bed. So very clear uh, I'm not sure why he's on the floor necessarily. Um, maybe the choking and gagging had kind of woken him up and then he rolled off the bed. Um, and interesting to point out, um, the bedroom is adjoining the kitchen, his room door being ajar. So both versions that we kind of heard before, almost true, except he's not really in a chair and he's not quite in the kitchen. He's on the other side of a doorway where his bedroom is, but the door is open. In the kitchen, we found the furniture all in its usual place. A tallow candle on the table, one-third burned, appeared to have been extinguished by Mrs. R., as it was her custom to be the last of the household to retire. Uh, he's also noting they did not use anything but common candles for illuminating the house. We found a hole burned in the kitchen floor, which was made of inch pine boards, two feet six inches by about three feet square. Um, that is one of the most interesting facts to me. Uh, I've looked into, there's a doctor we're going to talk about by the end of this that is still doing studies on spontaneous human combustion. Uh, he's burning different models to try to see what happens in, in the burning process. I have to assume this woman was more than three feet tall. So it's, it's bizarre to me that the hole would have only been that big. Um, I, I can't assume that she, if this did happen and she erupted in flames, is she going to stay in a standing position and through the whole burning process? That's just not logical to me. So there has to be something else that's going on here in terms of, um, maybe she wasn't standing to begin with. Maybe there was a chair that she was sitting on. And in a lot of the examples that the, the doctor is, is doing, uh, the current doctor that's looking into this. I can see him doing situations where there's like a wooden chair. And then because of the way the body burns, effectively um, all the accelerants that are in the body, namely the fat, uh, will drop below the chair. And then because of the burning up, it will eventually catch the chair on fire. So I, I think it's very possible to think that she could have been in a seated position uh, in a chair when this happened, but the chair might have burned away as well by the time they got there. 
He's also noting that the earth was about two feet below the level of flooring. So burned a pretty good hole in the floor. And then obviously a lot of the remains uh, dropped a few feet down to the earth. Eight feet from this hole in the floor was the kitchen range in which subsequent proof showed the fire had gone out at 8 p.m. on the 24th or night of the accident. That is seems kind of early to me uh admittedly you know we're talking we're talking people that are living by candlelight i know it's got to be very very different when we're talking about a historical um time frame like this but it just it's, it's pushing this into the possibility for me that something else might have happened it might have been earlier in the night um especially if he's saying the fire had gone out by 8 p.m if the fire had gone out by 8 p.m., I mean, how long did it burn for the amount of damage that it did to our body? And we're about to get into those details. Um, just, I don't know. There's some things about this that it's why we're talking about it on Brain Scratch. Upon examining the opening in the floor, we discovered a mass of cinders on the ground beneath. Upon removing them, we found the skull, the cervical, and half the dorsal vertebrae reduced very nearly to a cinder. Also about six inches of the right femur together with part of ilium in about the same state as the vertebrae. Ilium is a part of the broad bone that makes the upper half of the pelvis. Uh, the feet were found in the shoes. The left foot was reduced to a cinder, the shoe being partially calcined. The other foot and shoe were reduced to a complete cinder. The other parts of the body and clothing were reduced to a very light cinder, leaving no shape of former body. The clothing entirely gone. Upon removing the entire remains of Mrs. R, who a few hours previous had weighed 160 pounds, were now placed in a box that would hold less than one bushel. The entire remains weighed 12 pounds. The evidence disclosed the fact that Mrs. R had been a habitual drinker, had drank more than a quart of whiskey during the previous day, was intoxicated when last seen alive at 8 p.m. See, so even here with his information, how could she have been last seen alive at 8 p.m.? But then he's saying he found subsequent proof showed the fire had gone out at 8 p.m. I don't know. I really wish I could talk to this guy. Obviously, that's not going to happen. It appeared as if Mrs. R had burned on the floor without a struggle, but why the floor did not continue to burn is a mystery. The pine joist against which the remaining cinders lay were slightly charred, but not burning when found. There was not any evidence of a blaze having occurred. Uh, well, hold on a second. I'm pretty sure there's evidence of a blaze because you're saying that there was soot all over the place. We've got a greasy material on everything. We've got smoke inhalation killing someone, so... This, it's interesting because even just looking at how this is written, it's it's like this guy, he was there, he went through a real experience, but in his retelling of the story, it kind of feels to me like he's trying to pull this into line with the spontaneous human combustion theory and kind of trying to hit some of the same check boxes. Um, the skull and hip bone were really the only evidence by which it could be told that a human body had been cremated there. Um, once again, I don't know why he's missing the shoes and the feet in that analysis, but if nothing else, this is one of the very rare occasions where I can tell you guys we're looking into something this old and we're actually getting a reliable source and a professional that has written about this. So uh, I'm really thankful to have, have found this source, but of course, it's putting me in a place where I've got more questions, just wondering what's going on here. So um, there are, like I mentioned, numerous occurrences. Uh, there's one here in particular, an article from the Ottawa Citizen in August of 1982, talks about a woman walking down a south side street and saying that she just burst into flames for apparently no reason. Police said they had no explanation. Uh, there's just numer numerous, numerous different occurrences of this. Here, Phyllis Newcomb, this is an interesting one. She was 22 at the time. So first of all, a lot of these stories you're going to hear are going to be talking about people like 60 and older. This is one of the occurrences that's quite a bit different because she's a, a bit younger. Um, it's saying that she burst into flames in front of a room full of people at a dance in 1938. 
Um, and then there is something else down here, Billy Thomas Peterson, he's 27. So the, I really, I'm calling those out because they're kind of outliers for the main theory. Uh, he's a welder in Pontiac, Michigan, and he was found smoldering in his garage. You know, he's a welder. I mean, it's, I, I don't know if that one really fits this, um, but Let's learn a little bit more about spontaneous human combustion. I just, as a kid, I was terrified by the thought, is it real? Is it possible? So we're going to take one of the words out of that human and just look at spontaneous combustion very quickly first. This is from uh, the National Park Service. Spontaneous combustion or spontaneous ignition, as it's often called, is the occurrence of fire without the application of an external heat source. Due to chemical, biological, or physical processes, combustible materials self-heat to a temperature high enough for ignition to occur. According to the National Fire Prevention Association, an estimated 14,070 fires occur every year from spontaneous combustion. Rags and towels soaked with oils, including cooking oils, uh, hot laundry left in piles, large compost, mulch, manure, and leaf piles, and moist baled hay can spontaneously combust in the right conditions. So it's interesting to me that here we've got kind of uh, natural conditions for some of these cases. I mean, obviously, rags and towels soaked with oil, not quite as much, but compost piles, mulch, leaf piles, um, moist baled hay. It's it, it's very interesting to me that there are natural occurrences where we can say, yes, spontaneous combustion can happen. Essentially, there's no match that's lighting that fire. There's, there's no external source. It is a natural amount of heat, the right conditions, the right materials that are part of that, and it can go. But when it comes to humans, is it the same? Over at Encyclopedia Britannica, which anyone my age this is what this is before Google was around. You you were lucky if you had access to an Encyclopedia Britannica because it would answer a lot of your questions. Not quite not quite as much as Google does nowadays, but quite a bit of the big questions you had about life on this planet. Spontaneous human combustion is a mystery with an impressive literary pedigree. Herman Melville and Nicolay Gogol used it to dispatch characters in their novels Redburn and Dead Souls, respectively. But the most notorious case in fiction is Bleak House by Charles Dickens, where the sleazy, alcoholic, junk merchant Mr. Crook ends up as a heap of ashes on the floor and, get ready for this, a dark, greasy coating on the walls and ceiling. In the preface to the book edition of Bleak House, Dickens defended his use of spontaneous combustion against accusations of implausibility, citing several famous cases and the judgments of eminent medical doctors that such a thing was indeed possible. And it's interesting to me that they have that particular detail about the dark, greasy coating on the walls and ceiling because it seems to me like uh, Charles Dickens actually did do a little bit of research, at least into the journals and almost like the article that we read, to kind of understand what would happen around these occurrences. Although the scientific support for spontaneous human combustion was weaker than Dickens stated, it was a widely discussed phenomenon in his time. The public largely accepted it as reality on moral grounds. The victims were often alcoholic and overweight and more were female than male. So there was a general perception that it was kind of a retribution for a debauched lifestyle. Now for the important question, is spontaneous human combustion real? The answer is almost certainly no. None of the proposed scientific explanations for how a body would spontaneously burst into flames have held up to scrutiny. In the 20th century, forensic scientists noticed the wick effect in which clothing worn by a victim can soak up melted fat acting like the wick in a candle and creating conditions for a body to smolder for an extended period of time. Experiments have shown that this effect can produce many of the unusual char characteristics associated with spontaneous human combustion, such as the complete or nearly complete incineration of the body and the lack of fire damage to the victim's surroundings. The likely explanation for suspected cases of spontaneous human combustion then is that there is an external source of ignition, a match, a cigarette, or an electrical spark. 
that sets off the wick effect, but the evidence of it is destroyed by the fire. Although alcohol doesn't make the body more flammable, severe inebriation or other forms of impairment may be a factor in some of these deaths since the victim may be unable to react to a slowly developing fire. So for this particular case, we've got several of the warning signs. Uh, older couple, certainly alcohol in play. Uh, open flames around them. Yeah, the place is lit by candles. Um, so the likelihood that this could have been an accident, very possible. I would say extremely possible. Uh, and then their point about, you know, if you're drinking too much and you don't quite wake up, that might explain what happened to the husband. It could be that he started coughing, was just too drunk to kind of bring himself out of it to figure out what was going on and then was was overtaken by the smoke. Um, but let's jump over to LiveScience.com, learn just a little bit more about spontaneous human combustion. The mystery of SHC, and I love that they refer to it as SHC because um, it's easier than saying spontaneous human combustion over and over, but also it kind of makes it sound like, you know, a real thing like, oh, isn't that, that sounds like a uh, something that would actually be in, in medical journals. Uh, the mystery of SHC lies in the supposedly strange circumstances under which victims burst into flames. Typically, the story goes, there's no obvious source of ignition, no open fires nearby that might set the person aflame. Furthermore, the victims are killed and not, for example, only partly burned on one arm or a leg. SHC is fatal. As I've been looking into this and looking into so many different occurrences, I've only seen one in particular where they talk about a man who... His leg, he says, started catching on fire. He was patting at it to try to put it out, and that didn't do anything, but he wound up kind of cupping his hands over it and getting it to stop. That's the only one that fits outside of, of what they're saying here. Others claim that the furniture and floors under and surrounding the victims, even including their clothing, remain mysteriously unburned. So we have a little bit of that in this story because certainly the surroundings are being pointed out as not being burned, but the floor um, certainly was burned all the way through. Some of these popular claims are simply wrong. For example, there are many photographs of supposed SHC victims that clearly show extensive burning and damage to the clothing and surroundings of the burnt person. It's also important to understand a bit more of fire forensics. Many fires are self-limiting. That is, they put themselves out naturally because they run out of fuel. It is quite possible, for example, for only a rug, bed, or sofa to catch fire without spreading to the rest of the room because fires normally burn upward instead of outward. There's nothing paranormal or strange about finding a victim in one part of a room burned to death while the rest of the room has little more than smoke damage. What about the source of ignition? A century ago, it was blamed on intemperance and even God's wrath, Others have suggested that sunspots, cosmic storms, gas-producing intestinal bacteria, or even a buildup of the body's supposed vibrational energy may be to blame. Our bodies are about 60% to 70% non-flammable water, and the simple fact is that there is no physical or medical mechanism by which a person could possibly self-combust. If people truly could suddenly burst into flames without being anywhere near an open flame, Presumably, there would be examples that have occurred where the victim was swimming, in a bathtub, or even scuba diving, yet those cases do not exist. If SHC is a real phenomenon, why doesn't it happen more often? There are 7 billion people in the world. That is interesting, and I'm kind of surprised they didn't take it to another step of analysis there. Um, that's more people than have ever been in the world before. Population in general, has been on a pretty dramatic growth rate. So if it is a certain percentage of occurrences, even if it's something relatively small, having more and more potential cases, there we should be seeing it ramp up. And the data on this doesn't show that at all. It shows like some reports in the 1600s, a lot of reports in the 1700s, kind of thins out as it gets into the 1800s, and then gets smaller but kind of stabilizes um, through the 1900s and to where we are now. So it's it's interesting to me because it's a very good point. You know, 7 billion people in the world, 
more people. We've had it. We've had a, a pretty dramatic. Actually, let's even try to understand that. How many people were in the world in 1700? Here we go. So 1700 population in billions. So we're not. We're we're just over half a billion. Basically, 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.68. Um, so we're talking 680 million on the high side. As we get into the 1800s on the high side, we get close to a billion. Uh, in 1900, now look at what happens with this growth rate between 1800 and 2000. In 1900, we get to 1.71 billion, and then in 2000, we get to 6.15. We have a dramatic exponential growth from 1900 to 2000 but we're not hearing of more of these cases. And that certainly raises a very, very big question for me. And though we might not be hearing about more cases, we are still hearing about some cases that happen currently here at history.com. More recently, cases of SHC have been suspected when police and fire department officials have found burned corpses with unscathed furniture around them. For instance, an Irish coroner ruled that spontaneous combustion caused the 2010 death of 76-year-old Michael Faherty, whose badly burned body was discovered near a fireplace in a room with virtually no fire damage. So once again, for the warning signs, he's over 60 years old. Um, I don't know why so many of these people are being referred to as being Irish and then that kind of being related to drinking. Sounds a little stereotypical, um, but it keeps coming up. Uh, here at lifescience.com, um, they actually wrote an article about this particular case. Coroner concludes Irishman died of spontaneous human combustion. There were scorch marks above and below the body, but no evidence of any gasoline, kerosene, or other accelerant. The coroner, Kieran McLaughlin, reported... This fire was thoroughly investigated, and I'm left with a conclusion that this fits into the category of spontaneous human combustion for which there is no adequate explanation. But are there any confirmed real life cases? So despite the fact that they're saying, hey, look, we've got an expert here that's saying this, the rest of this article then goes into, look, this doesn't really seem like it's true. Uh, though some writers suggest that there are hundreds or even thousands of SHC cases throughout history, only about a dozen have been investigated in any detail. Researcher Joe Nickel examined many unexplainable cases in his book, Real Life X-Files, and found that all of them were far less mysterious than often suggested. Most of the victims were, like the Irishman, Faherty, elderly, alone, and near flames, cigarettes, candles, fires, etc. when they died. Uh, as a matter of fact, yeah, Faherty was close to the fireplace. Several were last seen drinking alcohol and smoking. Fires are notoriously fickle. Sometimes flames will spread to other places. Other times they won't. Sometimes fires will consume the whole body. Other times they won't. It all depends on the specific circumstances of each case. Uh, you know, I love having fires here uh, at, at my home. I've got a, a nice little fire pit I use out back. But uh, I've got a friend that does the same, and he was saying they were trying to have a fire outside, and they just couldn't. Like, they, they just couldn't. They, they would get it started, and then it was so cold that it would just be put out. And that's something that with today's story, we don't have a great understanding of. I mean, we're talking Illinois, and we're talking around the holidays. It probably was relatively cold, and I don't think homes were insulated quite as well as they are nowadays. Could it be that the external factors had actually cooled those pieces of wood to the point where the flames weren't hot enough to get them to ignite? Nickel also pours cold water on the idea that bodies can only be consumed by temperatures far higher than ordinary flames could provide. Experiments show that liquefied human fat burns at a temperature of about 250 degrees Celsius or 482 degrees Fahrenheit. So obviously we're talking temperatures way lower than kind of the standards we know about cremation level temperatures. However, a cloth wick placed on in such fat will burn even when the temperature falls as low as 24 degrees Celsius or 75 degrees Fahrenheit. That's, you know, that's like room temperature typically 
um, for, for some places, certainly when I was living in California. Uh, Michael Faherty's case may not be as mysterious as it looks. There was, after all, an open fire close to his burned body. It seems likely that a spark or ember might have popped from the fire onto his clothing and caught his clothing on fire. It's not clear why the coroner conclusively ruled this explanation out. So I mentioned earlier that there is a doctor that's kind of still holding on to this theory and seems like he's spending a number of years actually trying to prove that it still can happen. His name is Brian J. Ford. Um, I have a little bit of a quote here from him from an article at The Sun, and I just wanted to share this with you guys because this is someone that still is kind of a proponent of this idea, but even his theory, which this article's from uh, last year, I believe, 2000, yeah, 2019, even his theory on this, it's not quite spontaneous combustion. Uh, quote, alcoholism was traditionally thought of as a risk factor, but this isn't plausible. Fatty flesh, even when soaked in alcohol, does not burn. However, when a person is ill, they sometimes naturally produce traces of acetone in the body, and acetone is highly inflammable. I experimented with scale model humans using pig flesh that have been marinated in acetone. They burn like incendiary bombs. Um, I, I'd be curious to know, I would have to think that he's checking the levels on how much acetone could be produced naturally by someone as opposed to, because him talking about marinating pig flesh and acetone, I would just like to know if those levels are even comparable. Uh, alcoholism can cause people to produce acetone as can many diseases. My conclusion is that an unwell individual produces high levels of acetone, which accumulates in the fatty tissues and can be ignited perhaps by a static spark or a cigarette. So essentially, he's still theorizing that there is an external flame source that starts this. He's just saying that he thinks there's something else in terms of why a, a body would burn particularly well. But uh, yeah, so even the guy that's really still pushing for this theory currently um, says that there's likely an external source. So driving back, now that we've gone down this very windy road to try to understand spontaneous human combustion, seems like most of the science is pointing away from that. Let's take it back to 1885. What happened in this case? Is, is it something, is it an accident? Maybe to Dr. Ford's point, is it that type of accident? Maybe she was sick. She had been producing acetone. We know that they had open flames that they were using for lighting the house. It was enough to light her and that was it. Is there possibly something else? What if there was someone else in the house? Now, I know we read from the coroner's report and it didn't seem like he noted that there was anyone else in the house, but I got to tell you, I'm finding a few other sources that are pointing to that possibility very strongly. Over at AnomalyInfo.com, which we know um, is very good with his sources, We're, we've already leaned on him once in this video. In his version, on December 25th, 1885, Mr. and Mrs. Patrick Rooney were found dead in their kitchen by their hired hand, John Larson, and their son, John Rooney. So we've got another person in the house, not mentioned in the majority of the retellings of this story. Um, I'm also finding reference to John Rooney. I had a really good write-up that I found uh, at Reddit about this, and I just want to call out, um, it says it's posted by Armchair Detectives. I don't know if that's the actual username. It looks like it is. Um, really good write-up that's done here as well. While Larson alerted neighbors that something was wrong, he also alerted John Rooney, who then sent for a doctor. So we're getting another reference to the son. Suspicion was also placed on John Rooney, the couple's son, as he may have stood to gain by his parents' death. Not only that, let's think about this, John Larson doesn't live. So everyone effectively that was in the house at that time dies, except for John Rooney. John Larson was later cleared of any foul play due to the presence of an outline in the bed he had slept in that showed his shape. I, I still don't know about that. Um, John Rooney, meanwhile, 
was cleared as no evidence could be found that an accelerant had been used to cause the fire and the lack of signs of injury on his father other than suffocation from inhaling the fumes of the fire. That's a good point. Even if you try to theorize that the mother might have been harmed and then the evidence of that wiped away by the fire, we still do have an analysis that is done on the father. The conclusion there is smoke inhalation is what killed him. So that is certainly a good point. I suppose you could still consider the possibility that uh, if the father was known to drink heavily and pass out and be an extremely heavy sleeper, that, um, you know, I, I, I suppose there's other potential there where it could still be a foul play situation. And then, of course, this points out farmhand John Larson died just over two weeks later from lung damage. His autopsy showed he had a buildup of the same soot and greasy residue in his lungs that had killed Patrick Rooney. Now, I haven't been able to find the sources for where this John Rooney information is coming from. I'm really, really surprised that the doctor didn't mention this, but uh, I do know the doctor was also trying to keep the identities of the people private. Obviously, he was calling him Mr. R and Mrs. R. So maybe he was aware of John Rooney and he just didn't mention it in that particular write-up. Um, unfortunately, the only sources cited for this Reddit post are a Wikipedia page on SHC and the article about the Rooney's death that we covered already from uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. Over at Anomaly Info and the sources that he has cited, he has several books that are listed in the sources. So it could be that in one of these books is where this information is coming from. Uh, there is another newspaper article that's cited here. Unfortunately, that link isn't working any anymore. But I would have to assume one of these book sources that he's pointing out has the information about John. There's one thing I can't quite get out of my mind, though. Uh, if the smoke inhalation was so bad that it killed the father, Patrick, it killed the farmhand, John Larson, a few weeks later, what about John Rooney? Was he staying in the house? Was he possibly staying somewhere else? Wouldn't he have been affected by that as well? Fortunately, we just don't have those details to know that answer. And what we're left with is a Christmas mystery for 135 years now. What do you guys think? Spontaneous human combustion? Accident? Something a bit darker than both of those? I don't know. I'm still scratching my brain, and I hope you guys are too. Let's talk about it in the comments down below. Once again, huge thank you for another amazing year of Brain Scratch. We'll be back in January with new episodes of Brain Scratch, but I will still be back next week. New Case Cracked, new Seriously Mysterious. Following week, back with Case Cracked, almost the full schedule except for Brain Scratch that week. And then as we get into January, things will get back to normal. Hope you guys are having a safe and happy holiday season. We got to do everything we can to try to squeeze every piece of joy out of this holiday season. I know it's one of the strangest and most different ones that most of us have had in our lives. So I hope that you guys are successful in doing that. Take care. Have a nice weekend. And I'll see you back here on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked on the Lord and Arts Channel.